June 1940, and the German invasion of France is into its fourth week. The Battle of France had begun on the 10th of May 1940 with the launching of Fall Gelb. The Army Group B of the Wehrmacht had marched into the Netherlands and Belgium, and Army Group A had bypassed the French defensive line, known as the Maginot Line, by marching through the forests fought by the Allies to be impassable, the Ardennes. The French army, caught by surprise with a leadership lacking morale, was harassed by panzer divisions and pounded by sorties flown by the Luftwaffe. Churchill received a call from the French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud on the 15th of May, just five days into the battle, where the French Prime Minister reportedly stated, We are beaten. We have lost the battle. A day later, Churchill flew to Paris to find the French government already burning its papers. With a leadership in retreat and the German tanks, their operators' eyes wide on Pervertine rolling over the sleeping French armies, chaos was invited to play. By the fourth week, it was not just the French government in disarray, but also the city of Paris. The streets from the city are clogged with automobiles and carts. Fleeing civilians sleep in fields and barns, steal from villagers' homes and restaurants as they flee through. Trains are overcrowded if they are running at all. The war has brought out the worst in most. Gasoline is stolen from one car to be put into the next. The aristocracy finds itself disgusted to be surrounded by and begging with the lower classes, their upturned noses flinching with the smell of a people they, at least for some, had never encountered before. However, all the people are horrified to see the French armies fleeing faster than themselves. Amongst all of this chaos, the French authorities, however, decide to empty the prisons. A convoy of vehicles leaves the Fresnes prison south of Paris, its destination the prison at Bourges. Already being outside of the city, it manages to avoid the chaotic scenes. It trundles south through the French countryside. It's not a significant journey in peacetime, it's little over 200 kilometers, but this isn't peacetime. The fields around show the signs of war, potholed by artillery, wrecks of French army vehicles burnt and torn, part of the hasty retreat. The little convoy moves on. It's from the bright sun above that the first sounds can be heard, the source hidden by the blinding light. The sound, the whine of high revving motors piercing the air, is followed by the screech that comes with the dive. A sound registering so loud in the ear that it induces a shiver in all persons unfortunate enough to be caught below. The Luftwaffe planes come diving from the light, their pilots looking through the crosshairs of their aiming devices, their fingers depressing the triggers. A hail of bullets surround and strike at the convoy. Vehicles dive off of the road as their drivers slump over the wheels. Engines emit steam as their radiators are perforated. A panic ensues. As quick as the planes arrived, they are gone. To refuel or reload, it doesn't matter. The damage has been done. The convoy is destroyed. From the wreckage, the survivors start to appear. Haggard men, some unscathed, some bloodied, red with their own or of someone else's blood. Those who feel able to seize the unexpected opportunity to take something that had been denied to them run now into their freedom. Others do not know what to do. He certainly doesn't. He's only 19. He was never made for prison life. But he was also never meant to be on the run, especially within a country that he doesn't speak the language of. He's a good-looking young man, not particularly tall, but he has swept back dark hair, a few strands falling over his face. His heavy and thick eyebrows are prominent over his deep dark eyes that have a 1,000 yard stare. He's lost, alone, and afraid. He decided that the only thing left to do was to continue the journey that he had been sent on. He was going to report to the prison in Bourges. Paris has fallen, the news broadcasters announced across the world. The Germans had taken the city that the French had withdrawn from. On the 15th of June 1940, a day after the convoy was attacked, 
Friedrich Grimm, a lawyer and SS Stürmannführer Karl Bummelberg, arrive in Paris, tasked with finding the missing young prisoner, the one with the thousand-yard stare. After a long walk, he had arrived in Bourges, where he surrendered himself to the police. The police, shocked and surprised by this young man's arrival and perplexed that a prisoner had handed himself in, decided once more to send him on his way. France was falling. What did they now care for a young prisoner who could not speak their language? To avoid the problem, they decided to send the man to Toulouse. He traveled by the means that he could find, but how exactly his entire journey unfolded is a mystery. But as he moved south, so did Grimm and Bummelberg. They found the wreckage of the convoy and questioned other prisoners that had been recaptured or decided not to run. When he arrived in Toulouse, the French surrender had been announced. On the 22nd of June, 1940, just six weeks after the war had begun, France was defeated. A new regime was to be installed and France divided. The Germans would occupy the north with the sympathetic and supporting Vichy regime taking the south, where Toulouse, and therefore the young prisoner, was located. In Toulouse, he reported himself once more. Grimm's and Bommelberg's job of locating the young man was now easier, but there was now a problem. A term of the French surrender was for all Germans named by the German government to surrender to the occupation authorities. His name was on it, yet he wasn't a German. They had never given him that right. Despite it was the country of his birth, they had never accepted him. And besides, he was in the Vichy area, not the occupied zone. Yet when Grimm requested of the Vichy authorities that the young man be extradited, the Vichy authorities did not object. He was in the end just a Polish Jew. So he was taken once more on a journey, yet it was a strange one. The reason this young man had been incarcerated was for his reaction to events that happened in Germany. On the 27th of October, 1938, his family, still living in Germany, had been put aboard trucks as those around screamed, Juden raus, raus nach Palestina. They were left at a train station, their goods and valuables stripped from them, their homes passing into the possession of the Reich, and ordered to walk two kilometers to the Polish border. Yet Poland did not want them either, as Poland had stripped all citizens who had lived abroad for over five years of their citizenship. So the family of the young man and 12,000 or more people wandered the lands of the borders, cast from society and stateless. Now the Germans were making an exception for him. Where his family had been cast out and robbed, he was being flown to the capital of the Reich, to Berlin, where he was to get a special room at number eight Albrechtstrasse, headquarters of the Geheimstaatspolizei, also known as the Gestapo. So why the special treatment? Because this young man, in response to the horrors of what he heard his parents and others had to endure, had decided to act. He had been known for his quick emotions, violent when threatened, often caught weeping when hearing of the plight of the Jews. And with the news of his parents' forced exile from their home in Germany, he had travelled to the German embassy on 78 Rue de Lille and shot five times Ernst von Rath, a junior embassy official. He made no attempt to resist arrest. In the pocket of his long overcoat, a postcard read, With God's help, my dear parents, I could not do otherwise. May God forgive me. The heart bleeds when I hear of your tragedy and that of the 12,000 Jews. I must protest so that the whole world hears my protest. And that I will do. Forgive me, Herman. The date, the 6th of November, 1938. Three days later, as Herman sat in a prison cell, French and German doctors lost their battle to save Ernst von Rath's life. Now, it was the 9th of November, 1938, a date better known to history as Kristallnacht. The angered Jew used his German name on the postcard, Hermann, Hermann Grunspan, but history will remember him better 
as Herschel Grinspan, whose actions were used by Joseph Goebbels to incite the horrors of Kristallnacht. Achtung, Achtung! Hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin im Boxhaus auf Welle 400 Meter. Meine Damen und Herren, Welcome to Achtung History, a weekly podcast produced by the Berlin Tour Guide and hosted by Simon J. James. This is Series 1, He Who Holds the Devil. Episode 4, Blobka's Holocaust. Kristallnacht, Reich's Pogromnacht. Night of Broken Glass, whichever name a person or a nation prefers to use, it is undoubtedly one of the most horrific nights in the history of a peoples. It was the event that was to precursor the Holocaust. Goebbels, of course, had heard of the shooting of von Rath, and he, like others, hung eagerly on. Hitler had sent his private doctor, Brandt, to help the doctors in France, whilst he and the other leading lights of the Nazi party started to converge on Munich. A great event was planned in the city. It was an event to coincide with the 15th anniversary of Hitler's failed putsch, the first attempt that Hitler had on taking power, not by the political and legal means as he did later, but rather by force. On the 8th of November 1923, Hitler and his SA, the so-called Brown Shirts, converged on the Berger Brau Keller, where Gustav von Kahr, the recently appointed state commissioner, who held dictatorial powers over Bavaria, was making a speech. Hitler, with Goering, Hess, and others of the Nazi party stormed the building, wishing for an event that would be similar to Mussolini's march on Rome. Hitler's idea, take Munich and then march on Berlin, to which he cried to the audience in the Bierhall, stating that the actions taken were against the Berlin Jew government, and the November criminals of 1918. Yet despite some movement the next day, the 9th, his political march had progressed nowhere. Hitler decided to march, but no one had a plan on where to march to. It was former Field Marshal von Ludendorff, the hero of World War I that Hitler had managed to bring to his cause, that decided to march on the Bavarian Defence Ministry. But as Hitler's forces approached Odeonsplatz, Marching through the narrow streets, a force of 130 soldiers came to halt before them. They exchanged fire with the Hitler putschists, 16 of whom died. Hitler escaped, lightly injured, and was later imprisoned for his failed revolution. But it would be a day that Hitler would use the dead as martyrs for his cause. And every year, in a show of propaganda, the Nazis would converge once more on Munich for a grand display of remembrance for what he called his old guard that fell that day, the scale increasing by the year as the Nazis seized and consolidated their power. Now, 15 years later, the city had been decked with the flag, the only flag as according to the Reichsflaggengesetz, the Nazi party banner, the Hackenkreuz, the swastika. It hung from the Feldherrnhalle, where the Nazis of Hitler had fallen. It hung from the city hall, from the church steeples and palace walls. A day of special events was to be held. Soldiers of an inflated number reenacted the failed putsch. The national anthems were played, and the crowd remembered. Then von Rath died, and Goebbels had an opportunity. To the beer hall he spoke. He screamed of international Jewry and the Jewish world conspiracy. He could not directly or openly cry for anti-Jewish action, but he did, if it were to happen, say it would not be interfered with. The SA leaders and Gauleiters had their coded permission, seek and destroy. The order that flowed from the Rheinische Hof Hotel that had become the epicenter for the crimes to follow read, All Jewish businesses are to be immediately destroyed by SA men in uniform. After the destruction, an SA guard will be required to make sure no valuables can be stolen. Jewish synagogues are to be burned, as are Jewish symbols. The fire department must not intervene. 
All Jews are to be disarmed. If they resist, shoot them immediately. Signs should be affixed to the destroyed Jewish shops reading, Revenge for the murder of Vomrat. Through the night, synagogues burnt and shops were destroyed. There were a few instances where local police went against their orders and protected Jewish buildings and synagogues, quelled crowds, and risked their own lives. But the waves of SA roaming the streets, smashing the lives of the Jewish people of Germany, destroying their businesses, stealing their possessions, largely went unchecked. Heinrich Müller, a Gestapo leader, sent a telegram stating that it is preparing the capture of about 20 to 30,000 Jews in the Reich. There are mainly wealthy Jews to choose from. The next day, as glass from the windows of shops littered the streets and the sun rose to reveal the burnt timbers of synagogues and ash that lay on the branches of the trees, 400 Jewish people had been murdered, 1,400 synagogues destroyed, thousands of shops and meeting halls devastated and Joseph Goebbels sat writing in his diary. I want to go to the hotel because I see the blood-red sky. The synagogue is burning. We only destroy as far as necessary for the surrounding buildings. Otherwise, let it burn. The Führer has ordered 25 to 30,000 Jews be arrested immediately. They should see that now the measure of our patience is exhausted. The damage of that night was great, but then came the question... What about money? Was it a coincidence that it was as Muller wrote, 20 to 30,000 wealthy Jewish people that was rounded up? For that would surely be a too greater coincidence. So who? In any normal circumstance, both then and today, it would be to the insurers to pay. That idea was abhorrent to the Nazis. Why should German insurers have to pay for the destruction of Jewish shops? That was destroyed by Germans who, in the eyes of the Nazis, were justifiably angry at the death of a German diplomat at the hands of a Jew. Nuremberg, 1946 Mr. Justice Jackson, the American prosecutor, questions Goering. Then on the 12th of November, 1938, you also signed a decree that under the four-year plan all damage caused to Jewish property by the riots of 1938 must be repaired immediately by the Jews, and at their own expense, and their insurance claims were forfeited to the Reich. Did you personally sign that law? Goering replies, I did sign a similar law. Whether it was exactly the same as you have just read, I could not say. Mr. Justice Jackson presses, you do not disagree that that was the substance of the law, do you? Goering? No. The Reich was to profit from the destruction of Jewish businesses. Looting of a Jewish business was to be punished. As for the creator of the four-year plan, Hermann Goering, that was stealing from the Reich. The laws were to get stricter as the noose was tightened. In December 1938, a decree was issued stating that Jews could not own retail stores, department stores, engage in handicrafts, or offer goods or services, that they could no longer act as leaders of enterprises or be members of cooperatives. Then in February of the next year, all jewels and precious metals owned by Jews must be surrendered to the public office within two weeks, decrees and laws that were extended as the Nazi Reich itself extended into new territories. In February of 1938, the Department of the Reich Ministry of the Interior, to which Dr. Hans Globke belonged, had drafted a bill. It was called the Law on Acquisition and Loss of German Citizenship. If it had been passed, it would have set out the rules for and legalized the appropriation of the wealth of those who had lost their citizenship as part of the Nuremberg Reichsberger Gazette's law. Yet it wasn't adopted. However, it did prove to be the foundation work to a later decree. By January 1941, the German Reich had incorporated Austria, the Czech lands of Bohemia and Moravia, Poland, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, and Luxembourg. Nationality was an issue, and the head of Department 1 of the Ministry of the Interior to which Dr. Globker belonged sent a telegram to Dr. Stuckart 
concerning nationality within the Greater German Reich. A meeting was held three days later on the 15th of January 1941. Dr. Globker was in attendance. The meeting held within the Reichs and Prussian Ministry of the Interior discussed a draft decree on Jewish assets, which didn't pass into law. However, the pace of persecution of the Jewish people was increasing as the war continued on and beginning to follow a new route. At Nuremberg, Mr. Justice Jackson continues his examination of Goering. Then, it was you, was it not, who signed on the 31st of July 1941 a decree asking Himmler and the Chief of Security Police and the SS Gruppenführer to make the plans for the complete solution of the Jewish question. No, that is not correct. I ask to have you shown... A to and fro goes between Goering and Mr. Justice Jackson. Documents are shown and it appears there is a disagreement of a translation. The document over which they are disagreeing the translation of is a document that Goering had sent to SS Chief of Police, Reinhard Heydrich. Complementing the task, which was conferred upon you already on the 24th of January 1939, to solve the Jewish question by means of emigration and evacuation in the best possible way according to the present conditions. I charge you herewith to make all necessary preparation as regards organization, factual and material matters. Now comes the decisive word which has been mistranslated for total solution, not for a final solution for a total solution of the Jewish question within the area of German influence in Europe. Much later, in 1963, Adolf Eichmann, in his glass box to which he was confined as his trial in Jerusalem ran into its 77th session, was handed the draft of the bill discussed on the 15th of January 1941. <laughs> vorgelegt wurde, war, so viel ich weiß, die Basis für die darauf folgende 11. Verordnung zum Reichsbürgergesetz. The 11th Ordinance of the Reich Citizenship Law was to expand even further the persecution of the Jews of Germany. If they lived abroad, they cannot be a German citizen. They will lose their citizenship if they have a habitual abode abroad. Upon losing their citizenship, they are stateless and therefore forfeits their property to the Reich. They cannot inherit from a German that has passed. They cannot receive money from a German or even the promise of money from a German national. Those who do loan or promise money can be imprisoned for up to two years, or receive a fine, or both. Those who are in possession of property that is forfeited must make the existence known to the chief finance president Berlin, or be imprisoned for up to three months. Pensions claims of Jews who lose their citizenship will end at the end of the month in which the loss of citizenship occurs. It was, moreover, the virtually the basis, virtually the legal basis, which made possible the future deportations of Jews from inside the territory of the Reich, that is to say, Jews with German nationality. I cannot today say if it then made possible other measures of a dictatorial nature, but anyway, this legal basis made it very convenient for the leading authorities to give their instructions for deportations as being based on principle. 
gesetzlicher Hinsicht zu erteilen. Moreover, it raised and solved the question of regulating the assets. With both matters later becoming a model for a similar regulation, for example, in France. I cannot at the moment remember other countries. In France, I know exactly how the local German authorities or heads of legations brought their influence to bear on the French government or possible the higher SS and police leader to deprive their Jews of citizenship according to this model, precisely because it was easier to carry out the deportations on this legal basis. The work of Dr. Globka and others within the Reich and Prussian Ministry of the Interior in creating the initial draft which created the later law was in effect for those who physically carried out the deportations and subsequent incarcerations within the concentration camps that led to the deaths of so many millions of people was an enabling act in itself. An enabling act that made the removal and eventual murder, as Eichmann said, easier. At the trial... Eichmann's lawyer, Dr. Sivatius, would continue. As a Jew, one loses one's nationality if one resides abroad or has transferred one's residence there. Later on, this comes to mean that one has also transferred it there when one is removed across the frontier by force. And this results in this legalistic trick, as I would call it, from paragraph 2, where it says, the assets of Jews who have lost their nationality on the basis of paragraph such and such are forfeited to the Reich on the strength of this regulation, insofar as they have not already been forfeited. That is also what happened to the French. As soon as they had been transported across the border, a similar state of affairs came about. There was no doubt that this is what was happening prior to the 11th Ordinance of the 25th of November 1941. It had happened to Herschel Grinzepan's parents, but they already were not German citizens. It is what Heinrich Müller on the orders of Hitler had mentioned on the night of the 9th of November 1938, when 20 to 30,000, in the words of Müller, wealthy Jews were to be rounded up. Now, thanks to the draft document of January, there was an ordinance that made the theft of assets by the state legal if someone was to leave the country voluntarily or by force. Something larger, however, was brewing. On the 5th of September 1941, and backdated the 1st, the police had announced an order, an order that meant Jews, as defined by Section 5 of the 1st of the Reichsburger Gazettes of the 14th of November 1935, and who had celebrated their 6th birthday, were forbidden from being seen in public without wearing the Jewish star. Those people defined by Section 5 of the Reichsburger Gazettes of 14th of November 1935 were defined by Dr. Hans Globke's commentary. He, Dr. Hans Globke, had got his wish. The wish that had failed with the passports to have valid for Switzerland written within. His wish that Jews could no longer be camouflaged with German society by their names. To have Israel or Zara added to their names as a means of identifying as with his law of the 17th of August 1938, to stop them from trading on markets or in public spaces, as they all had to wear the yellow star of David. In December of 1941, the laws of the 11th Ordinance were expanded on by the Reichs and Prussian Ministry of the Interior, as was the Ministry's right to do so under Section 13 of the Ordinance. It was taking into account the vast areas that Germany had conquered during the summer and fall of 1941 with Operation Barbarossa. German troops now were able to bathe in the waters of Sevastopol or eat from the Sea of Azoz, so in the eyes of the Ministry of the Interior, it was only logical that the new areas also be subjected to the laws. Yet the war was advancing quicker than most had expected, with the German armies expecting to capture Moscow imminently. The day before the expansion of the laws, the 258th Infantry Division was only 24 kilometers or 15 miles shy of Moscow. 
with the war advancing quicker, the laws needed to allow for a swifter implementation. The order stated that now all Jews who had their habitual abode where German troops operated were subjected to the ordinance. It was a far-reaching law. It meant that as the German armies marched, any Jew that fell across their path would forfeit their property and lose their citizenship, becoming stateless. The fate of these Jews was to be discussed shortly thereafter. In July of 1941, Hermann Goering had tasked Reinhard Heydrich, protector of Bohemia and Moravia, director of the Reich's main security office, known as the Butcher of Prague, the Blonde Beast, the Hangman, and the Man with the Iron Heart, with finding a solution to the Jewish question. On the 20th of January 1942, in the depths of the winter, a gathering of select people came together in a house that overlooked the beautiful lake of Grosse Vanze. The collection of people, including Dr. Stuckart of the Interior Ministry, Adolf Eichmann as adjutant to the meeting, Heinrich Müller of the Gestapo, Judge Roland Freisler, and Heydrich himself, along with ten others, became known as the Vanze Conference. The conference began with a speech by Heydrich. He explained that the goal was to legally cleanse the German lands of the Jew. Heydrich nodded to the work of Department 1 of the Ministry of the Interior, Globka's department that thanks to the laws, $9.5 million had been expropriated from 537,000 Jews who had emigrated from the Reich. When converting from $9.5 million in 1941 to today, the wealth that had been expropriated when converted to 2019 dollars would equate to $166 million. Through this conference, they discussed ideas of the deportation of the Jews of the conquered and occupied territories and deporting them to extermination camps. Heydrich explained that Himmler had prohibited the idea of further Jewish emigration, and so now the new plan was to evacuate Jews to the east. To the east became a euphemism for death. Dr. Stuckart put forward the idea for the forced sterilization of the Jews as a means to settle the question, and Eichmann noted that Stuckart, the usually inattentive and procrastinating representative of the Ministry of the Interior, was greatly excited by the meeting. The problem that they faced and that they needed to be settled was who was to be categorized as Jewish. For this, they looked to the Nuremberg Laws, and in particular, the commentary on them, the commentary of Dr. Hans Globke. The meeting and its decisions were brutal. Marriages were to be dissolved, Jews married to Germans were to be taken to ghettos, the children of a Jew and German would be transferred to ghettos if they acquainted with the Jews, or if they had adopted the Jewish religion, or rather, as the minutes of the meeting state, evacuated. The rules were sweeping and resulted in many thousands being evacuated and Stuckart was insistent on the forced sterilization. A year later, the laws were expanded further once again. The 12th Ordinance for the Reich Citizenship Act extended the laws to gypsies, and shortly after, the 13th Ordinance. Now punitive acts of Jews are punishable by the police, and if a Jew dies, his fortune goes to the Reich. Later, in November 1944, Dr. Hans Globke produced a circular, where he instructed the registrars and supervisors on how to record the deaths of Jews, and to which tax officers the information should be forwarded to. At trial day 76 of Adolf Eichmann, footage of which is unfortunately cut from the recordings, but the transcript of what Eichmann said reads, This was, no doubt, a result of the initiative of Department 1, I believe of the Ministry of the Interior, under Herring and Globke, regarding the endeavours to deny German citizenship and sequestration of property of Jews, as proved unequivocally by a document which is before us. Eichmann at Day 77 that follows from the fact that this is a consequence of Ordinance 11. It was not I who ordered it, but those who issued the legal regulations. It also had to be enforced. 
In this connection, I would still like to say that neither Dr. Rayokovic nor Government Councillor Neifind ordered it, but it had been contrived in Department 1 of the Ministry of the Interior. And once these administrative sections were given the order from the head office for Reich security to go on from here, they could no longer raise fundamental reservations, they were not entitled to do so, these were purely juridical matters. At trial day 78, also unfortunately missing but preserved by the transcript, Eichmann states, I believe that, as far as in respects to the fundamental legal foundation, it was exclusively the Reich Ministry of the Interior that was responsible, and not the head office of the Reichsfuhrer SS or chiefs of the German army and police. Here, you can see by yourself, on the basis of these many documents, on the basis of some documents that the leadership was with the respective bosses within the Ministry of the Interior, and that the lawyers of the RSHA, for example, were asked to attend the meetings because they were to participate marginally, not in the lead. This means that these legal precedents fell into the primary responsibility of the departments of the Reich's Ministry of the Interior, and not in the Reichsfuhrer SS and chiefs of the German security police. When hearing of a note submitted by French delegates to the Foreign Office in protest to the resettlement of 6,000 Jews from the Tsar and Baden to France, Dr. Hans Globke, according to a Foreign Office memorandum, ordered a copy of the note, stating that the Reichs and Prussian Ministry of the Interior is the body responsible for Jewish affairs. Achtung, Achtung. Here is the Sendestelle Berlin, in Boxhaus, auf Welle 400 Meter. Meine Damen und Herren. Achtung Histories, He Who Holds the Devil, is a weekly podcast production by The Berlin Tour Guide and hosted by Simon J. James. To find out more, follow Achtung History on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Achtung History, or visit the website at theberlintourguide.com forward slash Achtung History. If you wish to support Achtung History, you can do so through patreon.com forward slash Achtung History. Achtung, Achtung.